So a question I get asked all the time as an astronomer and astrophysicist is why do we even bother studying the universe? Why do we even bother funding research into black holes and dark matter and how big the universe is if that doesn't have any direct benefit to society? You know, especially when we could be funding medical research or research into newer and better technologies that will improve all our lives. Essentially sort of like, what have astronomers ever done for us? What have the Romans ever done for us? But the thing is, astrophysics research does benefit society, just in ways you might not have guessed. It's very indirect, and it does take a couple of decades to trickle down to benefit things like medicine and new technologies and even the phone in your pocket. So let's dive into this. What has astronomy ever done for us? So let's start with the most basic of those questions, right? Like why we even bother doing astrophysics research? Why do I bother, you know, dedicating my life to doing my research on supermassive black holes? And for me, it's just for curiosity's sake, right? I think humans are naturally curious. It's what made us ask, you know, what's at the top of that mountain or what's over that ocean? And it's the same drive that makes us ask, you know, how do black holes grow in my case? Or how many other planets are there in the universe that can hold life like ours? And are we alone in the universe? And how big is the universe? So satiating my curiosity about supermassive black holes is the reason that I do astrophysics, right? It's the reason why I publish my research in a journal as well in the hope of satiating others' curiosities on the topic. And also it's why I do science communication, right, too, because I want to satiate your curiosity on all that's going on in research at the minute. But that's not enough for everyone. It's definitely not enough for your funding applications either. So the reason we fund astrophysics research is really for all of the unforeseen benefits that come out of it. The advancements uh, in technology or the inventions that come from asking these big astrophysics or cosmological questions. There's many examples of this. I've just picked out three to highlight today that have come direct from astrophysics research and are now benefiting society. First up is Wi-Fi. So if you are watching this video right now using your Wi-Fi, you've got astronomers to thank for it. And that is because sending signals wirelessly inside homes and buildings is actually really difficult. And that's because these signals bounce off everything, walls, objects, and just scatter all over the place. It weakens your signal and the speed of your Wi-Fi reduces. So when Wi-Fi was first developed, it was never really used because, well, the speed was so, so slow. What you need, obviously, is a way of recombining all of those scattered signals. So you increase the signal strength that you receive wirelessly and therefore speed up your Wi-Fi. Who figured all that out? Radio astronomers. So radio astronomy really suffered in its early days, sort of after World War II, because they just really couldn't get the same level of detail as an optical telescope with a radio telescope. And that's because of something called angular resolution. Essentially, when you talk about the angular resolution of a telescope, you're talking about what's the smallest thing they can see on the sky in terms of like its angular size. So if you imagine the sky is 360 degrees round, the moon half a degree across, right? So if you're trying to look at a star, it's even smaller, a fraction of a degree. If you're trying to look at something even further away, it's it's what we start getting down to what we call arc minutes and arc seconds. So an arc minute is a 60th of a degree, an arc second is a 60th of an arc minute. They're all angles, but they're incredibly, incredibly small. And that angle in terms of like how small of that thing you can see is dependent on the wavelength of light you're using divided by the diameter of your telescope. So something like an optical telescope, which has, what, 600 nanometer wavelength and about a two meter wide telescope, you're still going to be able to see something pretty small. But if you up that wavelength into the radio waves of around meters or so, then you're not going to be able to see anywhere near the same level of detail. So if you want to achieve the same level of detail with a radio telescope, you also need to massively increase the size of your telescope as well, which is why we've seen over the years bigger and bigger telescopes built all the time from the Lovell Telescope at Jodrell Bank to the Arecibo Observatory to FAST in China. You have these huge, huge dishes, but eventually you kind of reach the limits of what engineering can actually build in a, in a single telescope that can collect as much light 
as possible. So radio astronomers developed a new technique that allowed them to combine lots of little telescopes together to make a much larger one that was either kilometers across or even more recently the size of the Earth itself. What did they need to be able to do that though? They needed a way to combine all those different signals from the different telescopes coherently together and it's exactly the same method that's used to boost your Wi-Fi signal in your house after it scatters off all the different objects on its way to you. Not only that, but it's the same process that's used to reconstruct an image of your body after an MRI scan. An MRI scan detects radio waves that are coming from individual water molecules in your body that are vibrating. And so it needs a way to recombine all the signals from the individual water molecules together to give you this coherent picture. All of that from radio astronomers just wanting to be able to see things in a little bit more detail. Next up, charged coupled devices, aka the very first digital cameras. So astronomy and astrophysics really are observational sciences, right? We're all about images and image processing. And so because that's so central to the science, the way we take those observations has massively changed over the centuries, you know, from a simple hand-drawn sketch to using a very sort of big bulky photographic plate that had to be exposed and then developed, you know, sort of in the same way that the camera film used to be. But it means that, you know, because we are science, you want to do that in the most precise and accurate way that you can. Now, one of the main things you want to measure in astronomy and astrophysics is the brightness of an object. But that's really hard to do on a, on a piece of film or a photographic plate, right? When all you can do is really compare how bright one object is with another. You don't get some accurate measurement of, say, this is the number of particles of light that hit this specific part of your image like you would in, say, a digital sensor of some form. And so it was astronomers that really pushed for that technology to be developed, a digital detector that would record on each part of the image how much light hit that area. That invention finally came in 1969 from physicists at Bell Laboratories, including George Smith and Willard Boyle. And eventually then that trickled back down to astronomers as well. Astronomers were the first to use this new invention. They were put on telescopes, very famously chosen by the Hubble Space Telescope development team back late 70s, early 80s as well to be used. And then the technology has evolved from there, changed a little bit. We've got the detectors a lot smaller as well until now the time that we use them you know, every single day, either on a camera or on our phones as well. I mean, I guess you could say that we have astronomers to thank for selfies. And um, I'll let you decide if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And finally, number three, image analysis techniques. It probably comes as no surprise to anyone after hearing before that, you know, that astronomy and astrophysics are the science of imaging, to hear that they have pushed forward developments and improvements to the way that we analyze and process images. Because essentially what we do when we get an image from a telescope, that is a raw image. It has, you know, the thing that we care about, the object, whether it's a star or a galaxy or whatever in it, but it also has many other sources of noise in that, whether that's scattered light around Earth's atmosphere or whether it's actually noise from the detector itself. All those sources of noise need to be accounted for and removed by processing the image to essentially clear it up somewhat. How do you do that? Well, you need the tools and the programs and the programming languages that can deal with image data. Things like IDL and IRAF that were all developed by astronomers and astrophysicists, which over the years have seen improvements in the algorithms and routines that are available to help remove these sources of noise and clear up images. It's now the exact same languages and techniques and routines that are used across many different industries, but also medicine. Again, every time you go for a scan, your doctor maybe does a CT scan or an MRI scan, they're gonna take that raw image from the scanner and then remove all the sources of noise, clear it up so they can see what they care about, the thing that they're trying to look at in your body and diagnose and test. All right, but apart from the sanitation, the medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, a fresh water system and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? 
So that's just three things that have come off the back of funding astronomy and astrophysics research over the decades, you know, from asking questions like, how big is that black hole? Or what's the most distant galaxy? We've seen so many benefits to our lives, you know, every day. Sure, it's taken a fair few years for those benefits to trickle through, but they are there. If you want to know more, I've linked a great article from the International Astronomical Union, which lists even more ways astronomy has benefited society, including computing, timing things, and also communications as well. So one thing that I like to speculate on, which I think is fun, is to think about what's going on in astrophysics research now that we're sort of pushing for technology to be advanced sort of in that area that will then eventually trickle down into, you know, industry and society in say 10 or 20 years time. And I was thinking about something my office mate said to me last year. So she's a radio astronomer again. She works on LOFAR, which is one of these huge radio telescope arrays across much of Northern Europe. And she said the telescope is actually taking data and, and storing it locally faster than they can actually transfer that data from the local storage to their laptops or their supercomputers to actually do the astrophysical analysis on it. And I was thinking about how much of our society is actually reliant on data transfers. It's kind of scary if you stop to think about it. But it does mean that if we're pushing for faster transfer speeds for this strange reason to do with astronomy, it could trickle down to that infrastructure in the next 20 years and improve, you know, the speeds of information transfer and data transfer, whether that's communications or perhaps bank transfers or whatever it might be. And it, it just really makes you stop and think that all of that could come from this one telescope. This one telescope that on paper, when it was designed, had no obvious immediate impact or benefit to society in any way, shape or form, but could have these huge ripple effects down the line. The reason it was built is just because we as humans were curious, curious enough to build a telescope that works using the exact same method that Wi-Fi uses to bring all your signals back together in order to answer a big astrophysical question of when did the first stars form? Oh, please, shut up! A big thank you to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website with a lot of interactive courses on loads of different areas of science and maths. The courses are really engaging, plus they get you to start approaching problems in a really logical way, in the same way that a scientist would. And, well, they're really fun too. If you're intrigued by what the future holds for us in terms of computing, you might like to brush up on some of the fundamentals behind how computers work, maybe the science of algorithms or even computer memory as well. This course starts with what it means to store and retrieve data from a computer and uses that as a jumping off point into one of the most thorough courses I've ever seen online on this topic. It'll definitely prepare any budding computer scientists out there for the future when us astronomers start demanding faster data transfer speeds. So if that sounds like something that you'd be up for and you want to support me and my channel, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, the link's in the description below and it lets them know that I sent you and you'll be able to sign up completely for free. Plus the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you to Brilliant for bringing a little more knowledge into the world. Who knows where that knowledge might someday lead someone. And one more quick thing from me, Editing Becky. I know it's been ages since I've popped up, hasn't it? I am actually going to be on The Sky at Night this Sunday, the 13th of December at 22.30. That's half past 10 over on BBC4. So for all of you in the UK who are massive fans of the show, just like me, you'll know how much of a big deal this is and how excited I am. So I hope you all tune in. All right. Well, apart from sanitation, what have the Romans ever done for us, eh? And also, it's the reason I do science communication on YouTube, too, in the hope of YouTube Chew. YouTube Chew. <laughs> oh. Via Wi-Fi. Oh. The first up is Wi-Fi. I've said Wi-Fi so many times now, it sounds wrong. <laughs>
that you need is a way of recombining all of those scattered signals into a stronger signal so you get a stronger Wi-Fi speed. Stronger Wi-Fi speed? Faster Wi-Fi speed. My winter nights are taken up by astronomy. Stress and research proposal deadlines. <laughs>